So we'll continue our discussion about quantization. Okay? We learned about pruning, and this is the second technique we learned about uh, compressing neural nets. So we will first reveal about the linear quantization that we learned in the last lecture, and then we're going to introduce these post training techniques, which is super important. If you have an iPhone, you have an Android, running certain neural nets on your phone, it's very likely that either one of these algorithms is running locally on your phone, okay? Uh, so that you can deploy uh, your models with your integer, uh, edge integer, so very important concept. Uh, we'll in introduce how to uh, quantize the weight, the activation, and also the bias. Right? Um, and then in order to uh, fine tune and recover the accuracy loss due to uh, quantization, we'll introduce quantization aware training, QAT, okay, to recover the accuracy. Um, and then we're going to introduce binary and ternary neural nets to see how can we further reduce the number of bits, only uh, one or two bits. Uh, lastly, we'll talk about mixed precision quantization, which is very popular these days. You can have a mixture of 4-bit, 8-bit, 16-bit for inference. Okay. All right, so let's first review what we have learned so far. We've talked about uh, different quantization schemes from uh, floating point versus integer weight, floating point code book versus fully integer weight. Okay. We've talked about k-means based and linear based quantization where k-means quantization first cluster the weights according to the number and have this non-linear centroid code book. Okay. The centroids are non-linear so you have to decode it um, to run it in uh, actual inference is still done in floating point. It's just save the storage but it just doesn't save uh, the inference statements. Uh, this is showing how much we can compress by combining our composition with pruning and reduce LX net to very tiny little, like 3% of its original value. And then we talk about linear composition, okay, to have this linear code book, okay, um, minus 2, minus 1, 0, and 1 for 2 bits. Uh, we introduced this I find transformation to transform this quantized value to this uh, real value, okay, uh, which include a, a a zero point, okay, and also a scaling factor. And the most important part is how to determine this zero point, okay, and also how to determine its scaling factor. Okay, so the last lecture we introduced these concepts, but in this lecture we are going to uh, introduce how do we learn, uh, decide what is uh, the zero point and what is the scaling factor, okay, and how do we decide that for the weight, for the activation, and for the bias. So remember, this linear quantization is basically mapping from this um, like 0 to 255 all the way through this minus, uh, from this R min to R max. Okay? So if we have uh, two bits, the Q min and Q max, uh, which is the quantized domain, corresponds to minus 2 and plus 1. If you have four bits, then that's minus 8 and plus 7. Okay? And then we went through the equation in the last lecture. Um, given a floating point uh, matrix uh, on a linear layer, okay, a fully connected layer, how do we derive the quantized version for that? And what are the assumptions? Right? So we assume uh, the zero point for the weight is zero, the zero point for the bias is also zero, okay? so which simplifies the calculation. And we have this uh, scaling factor of the bias equal to the, sum, to the multiplication of the scaling factor of the weight with the uh, activation. And finally, we have the bias, uh, Q bias. We define Q bias to be uh, the, this term. Okay? So finally, we can just fully calculate the majority of the, of the weight lifting of the computation in um, fully, uh, fully inter integer modification. Okay? And accumulate that using 32-bit uh, integer add. Okay? Finally, we have this scaling factor, which, which can be done by shift, also together with integer operations. Finally, uh, integer So for convolution neural nets, um, we can uh, simply uh, change the convolution uh, from uh, change it from um, matrix multiplication to convolution, and then the rule of thumb stays the same. So let's uh, review this example. How do we determine the scaling factor? Okay, the scaling factor is determined by um, the ratio between. The range of the floating point versus the, the, uh, the range of the integer value. Okay? 
So in this case, R max, this is the R max. This is R mean, the largest and smallest value. And Q max and Q mean is basically one and minus two since we have two bits that fixed. So we can calculate the scaling factor. And calculate, we can further calculate the zero point uh, using this equation. Okay. So R mean, this is R mean, and S, we plug in this scaling factor to get the, uh, the zero point. So for the symmetric case, where zero point has to be zero, okay, so the scaling factor becomes um, the max the max number of absolute value divided by the Q max. Okay, so 2.12 divided by one. Okay, so that's the scenario corresponding to um, uh, symmetric quantization. Okay, so this is asymmetric where we have a zero point, and this is a symmetric where zero point is basically zero. So in this lecture, um, we are going to talk about how do we determine um, these hyperparameters, okay? uh, the zero point and also the scaling factor, including uh, the weight. How do we determine the Z and S for the weight for the activation and also by the, for the bias. Okay? So let's get started with the weight to begin with. Okay, so, um, the R max is basically the, uh, the largest value um, in, your, uh, in your weight, okay? So the problem is that for different channels, this, uh, this figure, how many channels do we have? One, two, three, we have three channels, okay? For this in, we have three channels. Um, and it's showing in this figure, um, the range for different channel can actually um, differ a lot, right? So if we do, such tensor quantization just use a single scaling factor for the whole weight tensor. What is the problem here? So this is for different channels. And this is the range of the weight for each layer uh, for different um, output channels, uh, so for, for different channels. So this is for this one layer for different channels. Um, calculate the range. Uh, the range of each channel is definitely not uniform. So using the same scaling factor, like the submissions for certain layers that are not large in their size. Yeah, exactly. So we will expect a significant drop of accuracy if we just a single the single uh, scaling factor and a single bias for all the channels. Okay. So the solution is to use this per channel quantization. And we give a specific scaling factor and bias for different channels. Okay. So let's see an example. Um, with our parameter four by four matrix, so this is the IC dimension, this is output channel dimension. Okay. So we are comparing this per channel quantization versus uh, the per tensor um, quantization. So with per tensor quantization, uh, we first have its R max, which is the max, our largest value in this matrix, okay, 2.12. And then we can calculate the scaling factor according to our equation, the max of the floating point range divided by the max of the integer range. Since we have only two bits, the integer range is from minus two, minus one, zero, and one. So this Q max is one. So the scaling factor is 2.12. Uh, and then we are going to quantize the matrix according to um, their value. And this is a reconstructed number. Okay. As you can see, um, this 2.09 is quantized to one. Okay. And this minus uh, 1.03 is quantized to zero. Okay. Because this number divided by this number is actually closer to zero. Okay. So therefore, it is quantized to zero. And then we can recover, reconstruct uh, the weight matrix by modifying this quantized weight with this scaling factor. Okay? So this is uh, the quantized weight. And if we calculate how much difference uh, is that from the original weight matrix versus the reconstructed weight matrix. So it's actually 2.28. What if we use per channel quantization? So for each channel, we can calculate this R max. In this case, the largest value in the first channel 
is one, two, three, four numbers is 2.09. Um, and then for the second channel, it's actually 2.12. Okay. Um, so we have different scaling factors. So this one is actually uh, 1.92. For the last one, the range is a bit smaller. So the scaling factor is also a bit small. So how do we quantize in this case? So we have different scaling factors. Okay. So this is the quantized uh, matrix. Okay. So you do compare the, the per channel quantized uh, value versus the per layer quantized value. Did you guys observe how any number is different? The last column, second last row, yeah. Yeah, this one is minus one. This one is zero. And guess why is that the case? Corresponding to this uh, minus 103. Right, the scaling factor is different, right? So you, I uh, use the per channel. I'm going to divide the scaling factor, which is 1.92. Okay, so this number divided by 1.92 is actually smaller than zero, but minus 0 0.5. So it will be rounded to minus one. Okay, but if this number minus 1.03 divided by this scaling factor, it will be larger than minus 0 0.5. So it'll be rounded to zero. Okay, so that's the subtle difference where per channel and per layer per tensor quantization can actually lead to different quantized uh, value. Okay. And let's reconstruct the original matrix using uh, the per channel method. And we can see the first row, the second row, they actually have different scaling factors, that's different value. Okay. And the reconstruction error, which is original with matrix minus the reconstructed one, is 2.008, which is smaller than the original uh, per, uh, per tensor quantization. Okay. So this is just illustration about the difference about the per, uh, per channel versus per tensor quantization. Per tensor per channel is more complicated, but give you more flexibility and low and smaller reconstruction error. If hardware can support this, then absolutely uh, this can lead to better accuracy. Okay. So here is the uh, summary. So um, the drawback is that not all hardware may support it and also create unnecessary overhead. For example, you have to store, um, each channel you have to store a different uh, scaling factor. Okay, create some overhead. But if the tensor is pretty huge, it doesn't matter if you have just one number for the entire channel. Okay, so usually this is a trade off. And nowadays, actually, such per channel quantization is very popular in, in tensor flow, in high torch, in mobile deep learning, on microcontrollers. We've been all using uh, this per channel quantization these days for uh, lots of the uh, vision models. Okay. So the next question is that um, since there's some overhead on the hardware, the natural question is, can we have the best of both worlds? Right? Can we have the uh, per tensor quantization still have lower um, difference and have a higher accuracy? Okay, so that's our next question. Can we make the weight ranges similar to each other okay, for each channel? Make it similar to each other so that even such per, uh, per tensor quantization is to have just one scaling factor for the entire tensor still work well. Okay. So this is something that's highly imbalanced. Like this channel has a pretty huge mean as max range. But after this, this thing called weight equalization, which we are going to introduce, we want to have it something roughly similar range. Okay. So that's the next thing we are going to learn, which is weight. Equalization, a very cool technique uh, invented by Qualcomm Books. Okay? Qualcomm is a, um, a very uh, in this area for its computation work, very cool work, trying to 
uh, equalize the range for different channels. Okay, so imagine um, we have two consecutive layers. Okay? This is um, the five layer. This is layer I plus one. Okay? And this is the output channel dimension. This is the input channel dimension. Um, imagine we have the row of the act layer versus the column of I plus one layer. If, if I divide it by two, if I multiply this by two, if it's a linear layer, then what is the effect? It's the same, right? Since for matrix multiplication, if I divide it by R bar and multiply this by R bar, then um, the result is the same, okay? So actually I can use um, this feature, try to equalize different channels. For example, um, this is, for I, I, I layer I plus one, and I plug in this X I plus one to the F, and this is the I layer. I just plug in I layer into X I plus one. And if F is, uh, uh, F is linear, then I can um, scale W I plus one, and then scale down W, w I. Okay? So if it's linear, then the, the final result is actually the same. So actually I can use this uh, characteristic to equalize different layers. Okay? So I, I define the scaling factor like this. So um, it looks complicated, but actually it's quite simple. So I just um, have a scaling factor for, for the i layer corresponding to uh, uh, um, the um, output dimension. Okay? Output dimension equal to, to j, Okay, so I is equal to J for I plus, uh, I plus one layer, okay? So this is layer I plus one, and this is the uh, J column, okay? That's why we have this I C equal to J. So I C actually corresponds to the input channel, okay? O C corresponds to this output channel. So for layer I, I have this O C equal to J, okay? Finally, I have this um, I C equal to J, I plus one layer. So what if I, um, but for layer I, I divide it by S, and for layer I plus one, I multiply it by S. Okay, so um, this is the original value for, for I for layer. Okay, so this is J row. Row is corresponding to OC. Okay, so this is this term. And since I S is defined like this, I just plug this in. Okay, so this denominator comes to the denominator. This denominator comes to a denominator, and then I can find it's just um, uh, multiplying this OC and IC for these two layers and have the square root of that. Okay, the way intuition is like um, if layer is one, the other layer is 100, then you just may as well make them both of them to be 10. Okay, since so 10 plus 10 equal to one, uh, sorry, 10 multiplied by 10 equal to one multiplied by 100. Okay, that's the roughly intuition for weight equalization. And similarly, you can plug in layer I plus one. Okay, so this is the original um, I, uh, J's uh, column of layer I plus one corresponding to here. Okay, J column of layer I plus one. And you multiply by this scaling factor, which is this. So you plug this in, um, part of this gets canceled, okay? So you can get the final result. It's also um, uh, um, for the ice layer, I plus one layer, multiply them together, having the square root of that, okay? So after this uh, weight equalization, we can uh, roughly make the different channels of each layer to be roughly the same. So what is the limitation for this method? If you like two at a time, you just keep doing it, keep thinking past the state because you can guarantee that the first layer and the last layer will be anywhere close to each other after one pass. Yeah, you have to do this propagate from the entire network every time you have to do two layers at, at a time. And also, um, it assumes the layer is linear between the two layers, right? So you do use a complicated activation function like sigmoid. This may not hold, but if you use uh, this simple 
um, nonlinear function like ReLU, right? It doesn't change your sign. If it is positive, then it's still positive. And it works quite well uh, for ReLU activation function. Okay, since we have the assumption that uh, the app here would be linear. Okay, so pay attention if you don't have such ReLU activation function. And is this, uh, does it require any training? Doesn't, right? It's only, it's like static. You can just get the weight directly, equalize the weight without any ray training. So it is pretty much a uh, very low computational cost. You don't have to do any ray training. Doesn't require you to find any training data and images. Um, so the, the way I, I remember that is usually, uh, the intuition, right? Rather than a complicated math. For the weight to the equalization, you just remember one times 100 equal to 10 times to 10, then I'm sure you can find the literature to find the, the details. The coding part is very simple, just a couple of lines of code. You can also reference Qualcomm's AIMET open source tool for those implementations. Okay. So uh, let's continue with another technique. Okay. So adaptive rounding. So quantization loses the accuracy. It's all about rounding. Is it optimal if we run individual numbers? So this is a weight matrix. 0 0.3 gets rounded to 0. 0 0.5 gets rounded to 1. Then 0 0.7, 1. 0 0.2, 0. Is that optimal? Actually, that is not, right? I just care about the... Um, individual weight, but actually the weights interact with each other. Okay, so um, the best rounding for each individual weight may not be the best rounding for the entire tensor. Okay, so uh, we want to do such adaptive rounding. Okay, uh, one potential result for adaptive rounding for this tensor could be actually zero point five might be rounded to zero rather than one. Um, so how do we learn that? So we want to want to learn we want to learn such um, uh, rounding mechanism using a small amount of training data. Okay, almost uh, post training quantization because it uh, still requires a little bit of fine tuning. So here is the the method. Say we want to choose from either uh, the the upper or the lower uh, to get the best reconstruction, we introduce uh, this delta, which ranges from zero to one, which is a learned hyperparameter. Okay. We run uh, this uh, W floor plus this delta. Okay, So we want to try to find uh, this V uh, tensor, which has the same dimension as the, the weight tensor. Okay. Um, and this value is between zero and one. And we want to do a, a, a function that map um, the V to the value zero to one. Usually it is using this rectified sigmoid. So remember sigmoid is between zero and one, but it doesn't touch zero or one. So we want to first make it like minus 0 0.1 to plus 1.1 and then clip it between zero and one. So we can reach either zero or one. Okay. So we apply this H function to this uh, the uh, tensor that is going to be learned, and then uh, try to minimize uh, the difference between the original Wx versus uh, this rounded Wx. Okay. Now, of course, we want to penalize uh, this uh, this V uh, tensor okay, by adding this regularization term that we encourage uh, this H uh, V function to be uh, to be binary, either zero or one. So using this method, we can give a small batch of images and try to minimize uh, the difference between the original WX versus the quantized WX by learning uh, this V uh, tensor. Okay. All right, so that's all for the quantization of the weight. So now let's switch here to talk about uh, quantizing the activations. So what's the weight difference between the weight versus activation quantization? So for weight, that is static, it's constant. You can determine the range at compile time. But for activation, the range for different image 
the, the range might be different. Okay, so that's the difference. So we are going to feed it with a batch of images. So for a certain image, it may have a small range. Uh, for a certain image, it may have a pretty large range. Okay. Um, so um, to determine the floating point range, uh, we have to collect those statistics before deploying the model. Okay, we want to first gather like 100 or 500 images and uh, collect the statistics. What is the mean? What is the max? What is the average, etc. Okay, so how do, how do we determine the uh, mean and the max, uh, R mean and R max value? Okay, so there are different approaches. Um, one approach introduced in this paper in 2018 is actually using the exponential moving average. Okay, so during trading time, you can find the uh, R mean and R max okay, at current our current timestamp versus actual previous timestamp. Okay, so uh, we can uh, use such smoothing using such a uh, moving average EMA, exponential moving average method to um, update the R mean and R max. So we give it a batch of image okay, and calculate that. And second type is actually uh, using a few calibration batch of samples. Okay? They are trained um, on the F32 model okay? and we collect the uh, dynamic range on this um, collaboration data set. So there are several ways to uh, calculate the mean and max. And one way is actually try to minimize the mean square error between the inputs and also the uh, quantized inputs. Okay, so this is the uh, range of the original uh, input, which could be from a super small value to a super large value. And for the quantized value, we may just pick, so we have a limited amount, amount of percent choice. For two bit, we only have four points. For the commonly used eight bit, we only have 256 uh, cent choice. So we have to smartly utilize our resource for this limited, limited number of cent choice. Okay. So for this tail, and for the tail over there, we want to cut it. Okay, so everything smaller than this value should be quantized to this value. And everything larger than this value, we should clip it to this value. To this value. Okay. So between this and this, we are going to linearly um, find the different sign points by dividing the range. So by 256, you have eight bits. By uh, 64, you have six bits. Right. So the key problem is really how to find the value here versus the value here for clipping. Okay. There are several assumptions. If the inputs are in, for example, Laplacian distribution, then the Laplace parameter P can be estimated from uh, the calibration of this distribution. Therefore, the Rmax, um, we can have this. Um, um, Pre-calculate the value, okay, optimal value, either 2.3 or 3B, either two bits, or 3.89B, either three bits, versus 5.03B, you have well, four bits. Okay? But that's not necessarily the case if our activation doesn't follow this Laplacian distribution. Okay? There's another method which is also widely used by media in Tensor RT in modern GPUs. Okay, so it's just using uh, such KL divergence based method to calculate uh, the boundary. Okay. Uh, for example, this is the distribution of the um, uh, activation value okay, from zero to 25,000. Okay. And this is the normalized number of cards. So we have a lot of parameters um, that is super small. And we, uh, as the value gets gets larger, uh, there are fewer amount of uh, activations uh, that is pretty large. Okay, so most of the value is pretty small. Only uh, certain activations are really large. So probably we should not find the max to be here because 
very few activations is actually choosing such a large value. So it's a waste of central aid for us. We may as well put something here, right? So everything larger than um, this value will be clipped to this value. And since there are not many of such uh, large values, we may uh, um, find it some, somewhere closer to the max. But how exactly should we uh, determine this value? Okay, so those are the intuition, but mathematically, we want to quant uh, quantify this number of this feature by uh, finding this scale divergence, okay, which is measuring the loss of uh, information, okay, which is the relative entropy uh, for uh, this information divergence. For example, if we have two discrete probability distributions, P and Q, one is before quantization. One is uh, after quantization, we want to minimize their payout divergence, which is defined by uh, Pxi times log uh, Pxi over Qxy. Qxi, and then sum them up together. It's very easy to calculate. And then we want to just find uh, the location where uh, we can minimize such payout divergence. So the intuition. Uh, is that the KL divergence measures the amount of information loss when uh, approximating a given encoding. Okay, so this is a given encoding. The approximation is done by two steps. First, clip it, and secondly, uh, discretize it. Okay, we want to minimize before, which is uh, P and Q, which is after. Okay, uh, the sequence between P and Q doesn't quite matter. So for more information, you can. Uh, check out this slide from the media, TensorRT. This is a wide, very widely used method, and we tried this and actually quite effective by determining the, uh, the, the range for convolutional neural nets. So, okay, so this is the illustration about for the uh, ResNet uh, Y52. So this is the distribution of activation for a certain layer. Um, and then for, by running KL divergence, we decided to clip it at this location. Okay? So everything uh, above this number is clipped to this number. So that's why you see uh, this new distribution where everything, uh, the amount of everything that is above this number is clipped to this number. And this is the number of weights because that is pretty big at this point. So everyone understands this sudden, sudden jump. jump because everything above this value will be clipped to this value. So there is a sudden uh, increase for the quantity. So here are more examples for uh, different layers. So for AlexNet, uh, ResNet 152, this is Google Net. This layer is a bit different from other layers. Right? Um, it's forming uh, this distribution. Okay? So everything, again, will click it above a certain certain value. And the clipping uh, decision is made by minimizing the payout divergence. Okay, a question? Um, is there any sort of methodology for like how you choose this calibration back? Or is that like, I don't know. Uh, usually it is based on like 100, 500 images. It should be representative for your top public task. Like if you are doing a common trading, hopefully you can find the rows and you are doing like uh, a flower classification, you want to find some similar distribution to this. Okay. All right, lastly, let's talk about how to quantize the pipes. Okay. So uh, quantization will uh, change the distribution, right? So common uh, assumption is that the quantization error is unbiased, meaning that before and after quantization, um, the mean value should be uh, similar. But actually, uh, according to this study, uh, that's actually not the case. Uh, for the original Y output versus the quantized output, um, actually the difference is actually not around zero. For example, this is the optimal error. So the distribution, um, this is showing the distribution of bias output error for each output entry. Okay, so uh, we can see some of the output error could be 
having a pretty large absolute value. Okay? And only a few of them is around zero. So our ideal case, okay? so um, is by introducing this bias correction term so that we want to most of the um, output channels to have a zero uh, bias the value after composition. Okay. Bias the value means you feed it with a, a certain number of images. Uh, the floating point versus the quantized value will give you uh, the similar mean. Okay. Uh, so how do we do that? It's actually pretty simple. We just run a few batch of images, we calculate the difference. Okay, so we introduce this term, which is defined by uh, quantized W uh, minus the original W. Okay, so we absorb this, uh, uh, this value into the original WX, which is the quantized W uh, times X. And we just absorb this bias, the bias parameter into your uh, bias of your neural network. And also, this can be inferred from the uh, batch normalization. Okay, so which is a very simple technique. It doesn't even require actual uh, actual training data or actual calibration data. You can just infer the bias from uh, your batch normalization term. Okay? In batch normalization, you have a a mean. You subtract the mean uh, divided by the the variance, right? So you can infer that from the BN layer. And after this. Bias correction. So for all the channels, uh, the error will be around the zero. All right. So here is a summary for post training uh, int a linear quantization. What is the accuracy for different scenarios? So we have the activation quantization, weight quantization, uh, and below is showing the accuracy. Uh, for activation, we have uh, symmetric and asymmetric, right? Um, Minimize the tail divergence or using the EMA approach. And for the weight, we also have asymmetric and symmetric quantization. We have per tensor, we have per channel different quantization trends. Um, and here on the right hand side, we have weight equalization or not. Now we can observe for most of the uh, large neural nets, like Google Net, Resident 50, Resident 52, a different quantization approach. They can all lead to pretty low drop of accuracy, no matter if it's symmetric or asymmetric, um, if it is per tensor, uh, per tensor or per channel. Okay? So the critical point is really such compact neural nets, which we're going to introduce in the neural architecture search session. So for mobile nets, uh, like if we use this asymmetric per channel quantization, the loss of accuracy is actually pretty significant. But if you switch to such asymmetric per channel composition, that can uh, get better. Okay. Uh, but really, if you use weight equalization, um, it can further uh, reduce reduce um, the loss of accuracy, showing that the weight equalization method plus its bias correction is actually uh, quite helpful. But in general, can we uh, recover such loss of accuracy from training? So, so far, we didn't do any training to recover the accuracy. But like in a pruning lecture, right? In pruning lecture, after pruning, we uh, can recover the drop of accuracy by fine tuning the remaining weights. Okay, so can we further fine tune the rem remaining quantized weights to recover the accuracy? So we want to uh, recover the accuracy. Okay, recover the accuracy after the quantization. Um, so uh, let's first look at the what happens after quantization and how do we modify uh, the uh, the data flow to uh, train a quantized neural net. Okay. Um, okay. So we want to flow the gradient back. So this is the input, okay, and we have the weights. After quantization, uh, we feed it to this layer by convolution, batch normalization, and gradual, which becomes the output. So this is the input, this is the output. And during feed forward, this is the direction of your back propagation, this is the reverse direction. We want to flow the gradient back to the input. We also want to flow the gradient back uh, to the weight. Okay. For uh, this K means quantization method, we briefly alluded that in the last lecture. We can calculate the gradient okay, using the um, 
the centroid as the input, okay? and we calculate the gradient. Uh, we match them using the same color, uh, which is basically according to the index. Okay? Uh, this is for the first centroid corresponding to uh, these gradients, and this is the second centroid corresponding to uh, these gradients. Okay? Uh, and finally, we reduce either by summing them up together or finding the average about the uh, about the gradient, and we uh, multiply it by the learning rate and subtract it from the original centroid, become which becomes the fine tuned uh, centroid. Okay. Um, I also experimented. So this is first of all fixing uh, the cluster index, assuming uh, this weight is always associated with the first centroid, but the centroid can change. Um, I also actually experimented whether we can also learn the, this index, but we find is uh, that the difference is very minimal compared with fixing uh, the cluster index for uh, such uh, four bit or eight bit quantities. So uh, what about the um, um, linear quantization, okay? not, not the k-means quantization? Okay? So we have this activation quantization function. Okay? Remember, we have this scaling factor. We also have this zero point for the activation. Um, so uh, what we do is actually this simulated or fake quantization, okay? which maintains a full precision copy of the weight okay? throughout the training. So such that this small um, gradient can be accumulated in a very fine grain manner if we have this full precision uh, value in the back. Otherwise, if you imagine we only have like uh, two, three, four of those integer values, it cannot capture uh, very little gradient change. Like two, you modify, added the gradient becomes 2.1, after quantization it becomes two again. So you do not, uh, cannot capture those lar large enough changes. Say one after 10 steps, it becomes three or 2.5. You cannot capture that if you don't have this uh, full precision copy of the weight in the back. So during fake quantization, we maintain this full precision copy of the weights in the back. Okay, so um, if it is two and, uh, and you get updated to 2.1, you still have this 2.1 in the back, but after quantization for feed forward, it is two. It is two again, right? So this is the quantization part for the weight. Um, actually, that corresponds to um, the, the scaling factor times the original integer weight. But we are not maintaining this integer weight weight in the back. But actually, we are uh, maintaining the uh, floating point version uh, to simulate such uh, quantization procedure. Okay. Um, similarly, for the uh, for the activation. So let's see how do we update this uh, linearly quantized uh, weight matrix. So uh, first of all, we uh, do such I find transformation. So this is a Q W, okay, which is the uh, integer integer weight, and this is the W, which is the floating point um, by, uh, weight that we are maintaining, always maintaining in the back. Okay. Uh, so this is a quantized W. So this quick quantization where uh, you want to recover from your quantized weight, okay? uh, you uh, subtract from zero point and scale it, okay? and this is the recovered weight. Okay? So this is the quantized weight, and this is a uh, full precision weight in the back. And you can see they are actually quite similar, but this both of them are represented using floating point number, okay? so that we can capture the small gradients. And this procedure simulates the disturbance, this change uh, of the quantization procedure. So for example, 2.09 actually becomes 2.14 in this case. So back to our discussion about the quantization graph. So we maintain this floating point, a full precision copy of the weights in the back so that we can accumulate uh, these small gradients uh, to this W. Okay? And also similarly for the uh, uh, activations, okay, we maintain this uh, floating point copy, which is simulating this uh, quantized version minus the zero point times the scaling factor. Okay? So these two operators are the two uh, actual operators on top of the original uh, computational graph. Okay? So when we are back to the propagation, we have to figure out how to propagate 
the gradient through this activation function and through this weight condensation function. Okay, uh, so through this activation condensation function and this uh, weight condensation function. This is actually not trivial where uh, if you calculate the out pressure for the, either the weight condensation or the activation uh, condensation, they are actually set function, right? So everything between 0 0.5 and 1.5, they will be quantized to one, okay? So the slope of such quantization operator is actually zero everywhere, right? So um, the quantization is the script values and the derivative is zero everywhere, okay? So we cannot back propagate the gradient. And how do we uh, solve this problem? We actually use this widely used STE, which is straight through estimator, okay? We just assume um, this partial Q W or partial W is, is just one, okay? So that we can directly calculate the gradient with respect to the uh, quantized weight to be, um, I see there is no operator right here, straight through. You just pass the gradient straight, straight through this operator as if this operator is a identity operator. Okay, so that's a widely used approximation uh, straight through estimator when we are uh, doing back propagation for the weights and for the activations. All right, so this is the big picture when we are back propagating the gradient through this weight quantizer, through this activation quantizer, we just pass the weight straight through uh, this operator without uh, worrying about the gradient uh, impact. Okay, so this is the accuracy. Um, for a post training quantization versus the quantization aware training. And we can see quantization aware training can drastically improve the accuracy compared with just doing a post training quantization. Question? Um, are there other estimators for passing the gradient to the quantum rate? Or is it always straight through? Uh, for other estimators, I'm not aware of. Uh, so, straight through is the uh, most popular. Uh, estimator. Maybe there are other nonlinear or more complicated schemes. So, um, yeah, that could be uh, something you could decide on yourself. But so far, it's most popular is a straight through uh, estimator. Yeah. I just wanted to ask a question. So, the other way of uh, for binary and third neuronals. Okay, that's a good point. Okay, so um, so far we get the effect of uh, post training quantization versus quantization where fine tuning. And we find actually, especially for this breast cancer um, uh, operators, um, our quantization methods, the uh, recovery of accuracy is actually uh, quite well, almost recover the full, full precision accuracy. So this is showing the um, uh, floating point accuracy versus a bit quantized accuracy after the fine tuning, uh, very close. And this is showing the latency reduction from about 15 milliseconds to only about six milliseconds as well, maintaining the, uh, the accuracy. Uh, this is running on the Snapdragon 835, which is actually pretty old. After Snapdragon 835, we have uh, 855, 865, and after Snapdragon 855, we introduced this HTP, which is a specialized accelerator, uh, which make it even faster. So nowadays, to achieve uh, 70, 75 top on accuracy, that's below, way below one millisecond. So that's how fast this area is moving uh, since 2018. All right, so, so far we talk about uh, K-means quantization, linear quantization, and just now we alluded to those, uh, even fewer number of bits, which is binary and the ternary quantization. Okay, so we are going to be used, how do we use even fewer number of bits uh, to represent neural nets? Uh, but before that, I want to give a, a um, uh, tell a fact that when you are reducing the precision, say from um, eight bits to four bits, 
you reduce the amount of storage by half, right? But the complexity of uh, the multiplier is also actually quadratic. So reduce, you reduce the computation more than the uh, reduction of the memory movement. But actually memory movement is more, much more expensive than uh, computation, right? So it's debatable whether it is worthwhile to go with even lower number of bits, right? So that's something to think about. You are reducing your um, uh, memory movement by half, but you are reducing your computation by four times, right? So is that a worthwhile decision? Um, that's something we need to think about. Okay, so let's talk about binary and ternary uh, quantization. Can we further push the quantization precision uh, to just one bit? Uh, so we have three rows. First row, both the input and the weight is real number. Okay, so we assume the memory everything is one. This is the matrix vector multiplication. Um, this is the weight value, and this is the activation. Uh, we just run uh, this uh, weight uh, times the activation in the conventional manner. And what if we have the weight to be binary? Okay, meaning that we have either plus one or minus one uh, for the weight. Okay, so that becomes uh, five minus two, zero, and minus one. Okay, so the memory uh, would be, uh, so the operation will be limited to just uh, plus the addition and, and subtraction since there's no multiplication anymore. Um, so the uh, memory is 22x less for the weight, and the computation is about 2x less. Uh, since we don't need to do modification, only um, accumulation. Okay. And when we are doing the uh, binarization, there are two approaches. One is just look at the sign. If it is a positive number, then we uh, make it to be plus one. If it is a negative number, then minus one. Um, there's a better approach, which is doing stochastic binarization, okay? um, saying that um, it's not deterministic, but it depends on your value. Okay? If it is um, closer to a larger value, um, then we, uh, we have a higher probability um, to quantize it to plus one. If it is a smaller value, then we have a higher probability to quantize that to minus one. Okay, so this is the uh, quantization function. So turning point is minus one and plus one, it ranges between um, zero and one. Okay. But it's difficult to implement in hardware because we need some uh, random number generator. But if you have a cool circuit that can easily do random number generator, this could be used. Okay, so let's give a concrete example. Uh, so this is our familiar four by four matrix. Uh, if we binarize that, we can just look at the, uh, the sign. If it is positive, then it's plus one. Ne negative, it is, it is minus one. Okay, so the distance between these two matrices is 0 0.28. So that's called binary connect. Actually, it will lose a lot of accuracy. Uh, this is very simple, but we lose about 20% accuracy. And we can do better by introduce um, there's a scaling factor. Okay? So we calculate the average of the absolute value of the original matrix. So it's one over 16, so it's four by four um, times the absolute value. Okay? Uh, it turned out to be 1.05. Therefore, we just reconstruct it by um, alpha times uh, this binary matrix. Okay? And just using this very simple technique can actually improve. Uh, the accuracy. Actually, uh, 0.2% better than the original NAS, which is quite interesting. Okay, so what about if both the weights okay, and the activation is binary, either uh, plus one or, mi uh, or, or minus one? So uh, we can do even simpler calculation. So let's see how does it relate to the XOR operation. So uh, this is the truth table for um, the weight for the activation. A one one is one, one minus one, multiply them together is minus one. Minus one minus one, the multiplication is plus one, et cetera. Okay. 
And if we map this minus one to be zero, okay, if we map all the minus one to be zero, actually we find it matches perfectly with the x or uh, x nor function, where uh, if both of them are the same, then the output is the same. Both of them are the same, the output is one. Okay? If one of them, if they are different, then the output is zero. If they are different, the output is zero. Okay? So such a binary modification maps perfectly well with the XNOR operation. Okay. Therefore, we try to use the XNOR operation, which is bitwise uh, operations is very cheap to replace such uh, binary uh, modification. Okay. So let's try to calculate the XNOR of these two arrays. Uh, one times one becomes one XNOR of one. And unfortunately, the final result doesn't match. This is plus one, this is minus two. Um, so what is missing to try to match these two results? You must replace the zero with minus one again. The zero with minus one again, right? So the zero here actually means minus one, right? So there is a there is a bias uh, there there is a, a bias term, right? So actually zero actually means minus one. So whenever you see zero, actually that is minus one. Okay. Whenever you see one, actually that is actually two more than the original value. Okay, so you just assume if everything is minus one, which is zero represent that, like you mentioned, uh, that is minus four. And then we count how many ones are there. If you have just a single one, then we plus two. If you have two ones, then we plus two times two. Okay, so we count the number of ones in this array. Uh, modify that by two and then um, add to this like minus n, which is the final result. Okay, again, assume everything is zero, then it should be minus n. Okay, we have n elements, everyone is, is minus one. Then you come to the number of ones in this array and modify that by two by two and, su and sum them up together. So let's see if this is the final equation. Assuming if everything is zero, then since zero is represent for minus one, then this is minus n if you have n elements. Okay. Um, and then you count the number of ones um, in the result and multiply that by two. Um, so this is counting the number of ones in this array, okay, uh, which is basically a pop count um, operation. Pop count is very easy to implement. Given a string, stream of ones or zeros, you count the number of ones in this stream, okay? returning the number of ones. Okay? So um, the uh, final result becomes minus n uh, times the number of ones in this array. And this, what is this? Multiply by two, okay? which are all uh, very simple to implement. Any questions so far? Why x nor becomes this simple equation? Okay, good. Uh, let's give an example. Um, this is uh, one minus one, one minus one, which is actually one zero, one zero. Okay, so this is one zero, one zero. And the activation is one one minus one one. Actually, it's one one zero one. Okay, so one one zero one. We first XNOR them together, count the number of uh, number of ones, which is just one. Then we have a single one, and then multiply by multiply by two, and then add to this minus four. Okay, so we get the result minus two, which finally matches our original uh, value. Okay, remember our original value is also minus two. So this is very simple to implement in hardware. You can do these bitwise operations. Actually, I and Eugene implement that in on a PGA uh, within a day, which is pretty simple. So let's see what is the accuracy uh, uh, impact for such algorithms. So for AlexNet, GoogleNet, there's an A team um, using this XOR operations for all these scenarios. You can have all okay performance. Think about like uh, five or six percent 
drop of uh, so here is about 12 percent drop of accuracy and x normal is about 18 percent drop of accuracy okay so you can you cannot get very um it's okay uh, accuracy but not perfect right but considering you are saving a lot of memory for the weight and activation, and only one day is required for the weight and activation. That's still pretty, uh, pretty awesome. Maybe helpful for some non-safety critical IoT applications. So since the accuracy is not perfect, can we introduce one more weight, like zero? From ternary to uh, from binary to ternary, uh, to try to recover some accuracy, right? So instead of use just plus one and minus one, let's introduce a third centroid, which is zero. Remember, a lot of the weights is centralized around zero. So we try to have better accuracy by introduce another uh, value, which is zero. So the new rule becomes that if it is greater than the threshold, then it's uh, positive RT. Um, it is smaller than um, uh, negative delta, it is minus RT, somewhere in between becomes zero. Okay. So in empirically, we uh, set this threshold by 0.7, this is the empirical value, times the uh, expectations about the, about the weight. Okay. For example, given uh, this, uh, our familiar weight matrix, uh, we calculate the delta to be 0.7 times the average of the L1 norm, which is 0.73. Okay. Um, so everything larger than 0.73, like this one, will be quantized to one. Everything smaller than minus 0.73 will be quantized to minus one. And like something between minus 0.3 and plus 0.3 will be quantized to zero. Okay. Question? Well, this is the point seven. This is a empirical value coming from this paper, okay. showing that empirically, if you see the mean times 0 0.7, that's a good point to estimate the threshold. Okay. And we, if we calculate the, the L1 norm for those nine zero elements, okay, so they are all together, um, um, this is the number of nine zero elements, and then, uh, divided by 11, we get uh, uh, 1.5, which is the uh, scaling factor, okay? Since they are all together um, 16 elements, right? One, two, three, four, five. Five of them are zero, okay? So actually there are 11 of them, that is nine zero. And we calculate our norm corresponding to those nine zero elements, so we can calculate the scaling factor. Okay, so we can quantize that into this matrix, which has only three elements, positive one, minus one, and zero. And with the scaling factor, 1.5. So using this um, ternary weight network, we can recover the accuracy from 60 to 65. Okay, it's closer uh, to this original like 70 uh, top on accuracy for this 18. So far, so good. Right, exactly. We are actually wasting one bit since we have only three centuries. But actually, using two bits, we can represent four numbers. Yeah, the reason you use still use tournament, although you, you lose one centroid, is that for zero, zero multiplied by anything is still zero. So you can potentially skip uh, the zero of one multiplication. And also by having this uh, symmetric uh, characteristic, you can turn multiplication into addition and then do the single uh, one single uh, multiplication and a single uh, scale factor. So that's the advantage for having such uh, symmetry and also having the zero as one of the centroid. All right, uh, so far we talked about the, uh, the positive value and the negative value, they are both fixed. 
Okay, what if they are trainable? So that becomes this trained uh, ternary uh, quantization, which I worked on actually five uh, five years ago. I was working on that project. So uh, again, we have this delta. Everything above this delta is uh, is positive, but the value can be trained rather than one, which becomes WP and minus WN, and and they can be different, right? So given a full pre full precision weight, okay. We first normalize that between uh, minus one and plus one. Um, and then we quantize that according to this uh, threshold. Okay? Everything in between is zero, above is one, uh, below is minus one. And then we can train this scalar factor okay, so that we can have a different positive and negative values. So by allowing such flexibility to have different WP and WN, we can uh, actually uh, put, uh, further recover the axis okay, from 65 to 66. So now we have the whole family okay, from this floating point to integer index, floating point code book, uh, into the integer weights to so this binary and ternary weights. So nowadays, probably the most popular is still this linear composition. And lastly, uh, several hardware like NVIDIA GPUs nowadays support different precisions, 16-bit, uh, 16, 18-4-bit, uh, 16 et cetera. So mixed precision quantization is becoming quite popular. So um, compared with the uniform quantization where both the weight and activations are quantized to say 8 bits, now we can allow different precisions for the weight and for the activations. For different layers, they are also different. Right? For example, the first layer uh, sometimes is more sensitive. We can use uh, P16. And some of the middle layers, less sensitive, we can use integer 8. Right? So the next question is this is a pretty big design space. We have eight choices for the weight, one to eight, eight choices for the activation. For each layer, we have uh, 64 choices. If you have n layers, design space is 64 to the power of n, which is a pretty huge design space. So how do we deal with that? Uh, so three years ago, we uh, published a paper using our IL reinforcement learning, similar to the AMC method to figure out what is the sparsity ratio uh, for each layer. This is figuring out what is the uh, number of bits for the weight and the activations for each layer. Okay, so we have an actual critique model the action is basically the number of bits for each layer. Uh, the reward is basically the number of bit ops together with the, uh, the accuracy. And for the environments, we plug in the half of the simulator. Uh, given a uh, precision, uh, we get a feedback, which is a combination of accuracy, uh, sorry, a combination of latency and also the energy, right? So compared with um, uniform quantization by using such non-uniform quantization, we can have a better latency and accuracy trade-off curve. Okay, and we can also tune not only the model size, but also the latency, even the energy. Okay, so given a certain energy, energy can train, say we are running out of battery, now we can have a, a much better trade-off using the same amount of energy, but have higher accuracy in this case. And here are some interesting findings for the uh, cloud device and for the cloud device for the edge device, um, for the weights and also for the activations, how many bits are uh, allocated. For example, on the edge device, we find uh, the depth wise layer are allocated with a fewer number of bits. And those, those point, -wise, point wise layers are allocated with more number of bits and it forms a clear pattern with uh, steps wise, point wise, and steps wise. Oh, sorry, uh, point wise, steps wise, and, and point wise for mobile navy tool, showing that the ROH agent is actually uh, learned something. Okay, so uh, that's the summary for today's lecture. We first reviewed the linear quantization, and then we talked about both post training quantization, which is super, super popular. Um, if you have just one take home from today, so just make sure you get a uh, the post training training quantization techniques um, are learned, and we are also going to cover that in the uh, lab tool which we released today. 
Also, we talk about quantization where training to uh, fine tune to recover the accuracy using these two estimators. And then we talk about some uh, uh, fine stuff like binary return rate quantization, mixed precision quantization. Okay. So, lab two uh, is out today. Um, you can access the call lab using the similar approach as lab one. It includes the basic concepts of quantization, k means quantization you're going to implement on yourself to see uh, how much uh, can you quantize without losing accuracy. Also, we can, uh, you will uh, do the quantization where training to recover the accuracy. Um, and then you are going to implement this linear quantization following those equations. So it gave you a step-by-step -step instruction integer only inference okay and this could be a start structure code for other innovations you can that can lead to your final project okay all right it is due on um, mid october hopefully give you enough time um, to finish the lab okay feel free to contact us during the office hour which is wednesday and thank you this is the end for the this lecture